2015 multiple choice, the higher biology 2015 multiple choice. I've taken out any questions that are no longer in the course. So although it's it's all of the multiple choice, there is one, two, three, four, five, six questions out of it. Okay, so just 14. Okay, which line in the table below shows features of the human genome? I actually quite like this question almost as a definition, okay? Your genome contains uh, base sequences that regulate transcription, absolutely, okay? Base sequences that are transcribed to RNA but never translated, absolutely, okay? Base sequences which form uh, primary transcripts, yep. It's a nice definition of the human genome and as a whole. Okay, question two. The diagram below shows a eukaryotic gene containing introns and exons and a scale bar representing the number of bases in the gene. How many bases will there be in the mature mRNA formed from the primary transcript of the gene? Okay, really what this is testing is, do you know that it's introns that you cut out? Okay, and it's exons that you splice together and retain. Okay, you got to find a way to make sure you're happy with that term. I quite like just using the introns are interrupting sequence okay they are interrupting so they're the ones that are not shouldn't be there okay so we're looking for the total size so this starts at 300 sorry 720 okay and we cut out uh, this section here which is a hundred base pairs going from 250 to 350 and we cut out this section here which is another 80 Okay, so 720 minus 100 minus 80 gives us B. Okay, question four. Events in the evolution of life on the Earth. In which order are they thought to have occurred? Right, well, let's just be very clear. Everything starts off in the sea. So everything starts off there. So land plants appearing is the last thing, which actually would have given you it straight away. But also to be clear, vertebrates are a sub part of animals. We start with animals and then it, it, we have branching to get to vertebrates. So it's one, then two, then three. Okay, question five. I've tried, I've had to pull a little bit of it to the side just so it'll all fit in. Okay, the graph below shows a molecular plot which compares the amino acid sequences in the protein cytochrome C in various vertebrate groups. And we have a little picture here. So this is about using a molecular clock to try and figure out how closely related things are. And a molecular clock is just giving you a, it's giving you a tick in terms of a mutation, okay? And it, you know how often those mutations occur. So that rate tells you if I've racked up five mutations, then I've racked up five times the mutation rate time, okay? So the differences, the greater the differences, the greater the divergence which means it was longer ago in time that they actually split, which is not surprising, okay? So really, when it says from the information in the graph, which vertebrate group shared a common ancestor most recently, I'm just looking for which one is lowest down in the difference, closest in time. Uh, so P, birds and reptiles, and therefore D. Okay, question six. I've also had to do a little bit of a shuffle here. Okay, the melting temperature of a molecule of DNA is the temperature which half of its base pair sequence, so sorry, base pairs separate, not sequence. TM is proportional to the percentage of the guanine to cytosine base pairs in the molecule shown on the graph below. So basically what we're saying is as we increase the GC pairing, we increase the amount of um, temperature required to split them. Just as an aside, it's because this is actually what's happening with our pairing and GC has three hydrogen bonds and HT only has two. So the more G to C you've got, um, the greater the difficulty in melting all the bonds. Okay, but that's an aside and you don't need to know it. Right, so what we're looking for is the percentage of G to C pairs and what we've got over here is a number. So what you're gonna have to do is get, what is that as a percentage? So it's 800 over the total, which is 2000 and that's 40 percent okay so here's your 40 percent read up there's your point read across here's my line and 70 sorry 86 there we go okay right question eight the effect of an antibiotic on a bacterial species tested by spreading a culture of each of the bacterial species on agar plates 
add a disc of absorbent paper soaked in the antibiotic. Little picture. Okay. The plate was incubated for 24 hours at 30 degrees C and the growth examined. Which of the following would be a suitable control for this experiment? So make absolutely sure you're certain of what a control is. A control is something that allows you to compare a result where you've removed the thing that you think was doing whatever you're looking at. So what we're looking at here is the effect of an antibiotic. So what we want to see is, okay, if the antibiotic was not there, how would the bacterial species have behaved? Okay, so what I'm looking for is something that does that. So no bacteria, well, that wouldn't help. Okay, incubate human body temperature would change entirely what the structure of the experiment was, wouldn't act as a control. Use a disc with no antibiotic, that we like. Okay, because what you've done there is you've taken out the effect of the antibiotic, but you've still left a disc there to see it's not something about like having a physical thing there is an issue. And we wouldn't use D because that would be changing the antibiotic. And remember, it's just that antibiotic, the original that you're trying to find out. Okay, question 10. When salmon migrate from freshwater into seawater, changes in concentration of their surroundings are detected and the activity of the iron pumps in the salmon gills increases. The activity of the iron pumps decrease when the salmon migrate back to fresh water. Which line in the table below shows the description of the salmon and the control of its iron pumps? Okay, so you've got two questions really here. First thing is, um, do we recognise the difference between a behavioural control or a negative feedback control? Um, so if we remember negative feedback, we have wherever we want the thing to be at, whatever the factor is, we have to go to a receptor, which then sends messages to effectors, and then by corrective mechanism, we bring it back down to where we want. Or the other way around. Okay. But what we have is an increase causes a decrease and a decrease causes an increase. Okay. And what we've got here is changes in the concentration of their surroundings are detected. And then the activity increases. And then we've got the activity then decreases. So we have this. You know, we've got a change in the, in the effect or change here. So what we've got is definitely negative feedback. OK, and then you have to decide if they are a conformer or a regulator. Now, anything that is done by physiological systems, OK, is a regulator's way of dealing with things. And what they've tried to do here is change what's, what they're doing so that the internal remains the same regardless of the external. So they are definitely regulators, hence C. Okay, question 11. The rate of sweat production of two individuals, X and Y, measured during and after a period of exercise, and you've got your little picture here. Which of the following conclusions can be drawn from the graph? Okay, so we have individual X, just being absolutely, it's a bit tricky to read, right, right, okay, so individual X is actually doing this. Okay, they are the straight line. That's actually my... My highlight was not perfect on that one going up the way, and no, definitely on the way down. Okay, and then we've got our dotted line, this other one. Okay, so let's just work it through. Uh, just work through each one. The rate of sweat production of individual X is always greater than individual Y. Okay, so individual X is the is the line. Okay, is it always greater than individual Y? Mm, no, because here it's the same. So don't like that one. Okay, individuals X and Y both reach their maximum sweat production at 20 minutes. Well, here's individual Y, they reach their maximum before 20, and individual X reaches it at 20, but not Y, so no. Individual X starts increased sweat production sooner than individual Y. Um, here's individual Y, they start straight away. X actually doesn't sweat more, um, although they were already sweating more, um, till five minutes in. Okay, so nope. The greatest difference in sweat production by individuals X and Y is at 50 minutes. Here's 50 minutes. Is that the biggest gap? Yeah. Okay, I could check over here. Um, that's the only other one that, that looks kind of close to it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 10 boxes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 boxes. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Question 12. The results of pharmacogenetic tests on a drug designed to treat liver infection in a group of patients. Okay, here's our patients. We've got a little kind of grid square set of, of tables to try and show our kind of crossing between. 
toxic side effects and non-toxic side effects and whether they did better by it. What percentage of the patients gained benefit but showed toxic side effects? So I need beneficial and toxic. So my crossover point is here. So I have 30 of them out of, I need all of them, not not just taking out the 30, so just be careful on that one. So that's 30 out of 150. Okay, so 20%. Okay, question 14. Which of the following results in a transfer of electrons down the electron transport chains during the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis? Oh, I've not spaced that properly, never mind. Okay, um, so which of them results in the transfer of electrons? Okay, so ATP synthesis is the result of the transfer of electrons, so it's not that. Okay. Um, we are looking for water is split by photolysis again is the result of the transfer not resulting in the transfer and any dp converted to any dph um, is what then drives the transport chain so it's not that one the original thing that has to start with is the pigment molecules absorb energy in the first place um, to get you your high energy electrons to even start everything off okay not wild about it as a question but it's okay um, soil type dependent on the composition of its components which in turn affects the productivity of plants growing in it table below shows the percentage of each component present in four different soils okay which of the following charts represents a clay loam okay so i am looking for this so i need to have clay at 20 to 35 percent silt between 20 and 60 and sand between 20 and 50. Okay, right, you've just got to spend a bit of time working it through really. Um, okay, so where, where will we start? Let's start with sand. Okay, so sand is your white. Uh, 20 to 50 percent of sand can get rid of A very quickly because that's obviously 75 percent. Um, B, that is less than 20 percent, so not that one. Um, C, well, that probably looks about 30%, so that would be okay. And D, that's well under E as well. So I'm going with C, but just to check, uh, my silt has to be between 20 and 60, and my clay has to be between 20 and 35. Well, my, definitely my clay, you know, 25 would have been there. So that looks reasonable to be close to 30, 35, between 30 and 35. And the silt... You know, that's definitely between 20 and 60. So, yes, C. You just got to work the, the information. Okay, question 17. Table below shows the results of beet armyworm larvae found in plots of cotton plants. Some plots were treated with insecticide on the 27th of June and the 1st of August and other plots left untreated. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for the differences between the treated and the untreated plots. Okay, so you've got to just work this very carefully. Right, so the treated plots, remember, were treated on the 27th of June, so sometime before this, and the 1st of August, so in here. Okay, so in the treated plots, at the start and the untreated, they were the same. Okay, but then this actually shot up in the treated plots, and then it kind of drop back down and kind of came back up again but it didn't this did not help it at all and the untreated plot actually dropped and then it came back up but not as much and then came back down again okay um same big increase in the treated plots in august um and in the untreated plots it was still kind of doing okay so you've done something you totally messed with a kind of natural system somehow here uh, most likely explanation, the insecticide kills a predator of the larvae. Would that make sense? Yes, it absolutely would. If you knocked out a predator, then what would happen is their numbers would increase, which is what's happened. Okay, so I like this one. Just check the other ones. The larvae are resistant to the insecticide. Um, that one's not quite so so good in an answer for this I would expect then that they would just follow the same pattern as the untreated which they're not doing they've got like a boost okay so it's not that uh, the beet army worm breeds in July mm. it's not absolutely clear maybe 
the 2 to 17 here is true. Maybe that's that's a breeding kind of 33, but that's a drop, so no. No, it doesn't that doesn't work as a as a best kind of case of information. The larvae have a short life cycle. It's maybe true, but that's not going to help you in terms of this information. Okay, so A. Question 18. In primates such as chimpanzees... No, I didn't put that properly. Never mind. In chimpanzees such as... Chi, chim, I'm saying this repeatedly. In primates such as chimpanzees, parental care, is it occurs over a short time? No. Okay, the whole point is that primates spend a long time with parental care um, for <laughs> a complex social behaviour learning. Okay, um, and that's that's really what we're looking for. Um, increases appearance social status within the group. It might have some impact on that, but it's not the parental care that does that. It's actually just the fact that there's a child. Um, involves appeasement behaviour. Uh, within a group again there may be something in that in terms of the hierarchy but then it wouldn't be a appeasement behavior as such it would be a, a, an attempt to ingratiate which is not quite the same as appeasement okay so b question 19 altruistic behavior between closely related animals okay right so what we're looking for here reduces competition between individuals in the population not really okay uh, increases survival chance of the donor animal? Definitely not. Okay, the donor, the whole definition of altruistic means that you are doing something to the detriment of yourself, whether in energy or whatever. Increases the frequency of shared genes in the next generation? That is true. Because if you manage to keep anyone's survival better um, that is closely related to you, then that means that the genes are likely to be shared and therefore passed on. Um, reduces unnecessary aggression and conflict in social groups? No. Okay, so see. And that's all of the multiple choice from that section.